We are back for another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. My name is Paul Edwards and my co-host Jason Todd joining me again here in the studio. Jason, how are you? I'm very well today. You? Couldn't be better. Happy and excited to bring on another guest uh, with a really informative and exciting and timely book if you are in leadership. Our guest this week is Steve Lover. He's the author of Ignite, Fueling World-Class Performance, even if your employees are not yet world-class. So let's bring him into the studio, Steve. Great to have you with us on the Emissary Authors Podcast. How are you, my friend? Awesome. Thanks. How are you guys? Nice to be here. Good to have Doing you here. Great. Yeah. And, uh, and you've got this, um, how recently are, this is a brand new launch for you at the time of recording, isn't it? You've just actually your paperback will not even be out until another week. I okay. just offer yeah. copies on Friday. All so, right. Yeah, the ebook is up and it's out, but it's fresh is about as fresh as a book can get. Well, that's fantastic. This is uh the recording here at the end of March, uh, which means by the time this comes out, people will be, uh, will be able to purchase that book on Amazon. We'll put the links up in the, in the, uh, chat and then also on the screen in a little bit. Great. Thank you. Yeah. So let's, let's dig into this a little bit, Steve, because you basically have got a, a, a ton of experience now as a business coach. You've been doing that for a long time, uh, since 2006, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Five. Years. And, and you've had, you've written this book and you're really concentrating on something that's that's actually, I think is, is very difficult to do, even if you're aware it needs to be done. And that is creating a culture and developing a team within a company. So, you know, take us back to where this started for you. What was the, what was the impetus and the, the fire that grew up in your belly that said, I need to write this book. So actually nothing just came and said, I need to write this book. This has been a process that's been working probably for 25 years and the real idea, it, it really, I'll tell you where the base of it really started. I was a trainer at a top 100 financial company, an insurance company. And they had this really interesting perspective. And they said, if an agent knew what to do, he had the knowledge and he had the skill, he could prove by a role play that he could do it. And he had the desire, he should be very successful. There's no reason he can't be successful. And I had a room full of agents that had the knowledge could show in a role play they could do it, were dying to be successful because they were flapping all over the place and were failing. Mm. So it's very nice to have that cute little three-step process, but if you haven't dealt with a person and helped them deal with whatever's stopping them from doing what they have to do or helping them get some confidence, it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. If it feels like it's 3,000 3, pounds, you're not picking it up. I, uh, I can't tell you as a veteran of the property casualty industry, how much I empathize <laughs> with that because I had no shortage of insurance sales managers and agency owners tell me, you just got to work the phones. If you make the calls, you'll make the sales. And I worked the phones and I didn't make the sales and so, you know, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's an interesting thing. So I, I really spent a lot of time thinking and actually delving into this and Two worlds came together. I'm a father of six children. And as they were growing up, uh, I got very disenchanted with the idea of the self-esteem movement and, you know, build them up and build them up. There's something wrong with that model. And that came coalesced timing wise, very interesting with my experience in the insurance company. And basically I created a model and the model is a really short explanation on how self, uh, not self-esteem, sorry, how confidence works. And what I've come to believe is the number one factor that will decide if somebody can be successful is confidence more than anything else. It's not the schooling. It's not the experience. It's not anything else. It is, are they confident? Oh, do they have a way to get confidence? They're actually even getting really, really granular. Are they confident they can learn new skills and then do them well? Yeah. It's not just the confidence in the thing because. It's a big mistake people make. They think that confidence is something you talk yourself into. And it's not. Success Good. breeds confidence. It's not the other way around. You, you don't become confident and then successful. You became successful, therefore you became confident and you can't get better. I liked what you said. I, I, I'm, you're now jogging my memory. You said, I'm, I'm, I'm just paraphrasing here. You said something like, uh, don't look for 
don't look for confidence, look for evidence because evidence creates confidence, right? Isn't yeah. It? That's, that's actually a quote from Alex Hermosi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually did quote that in the book and that's exactly correct. But the main thing is, is if, if I, and you know what, all of us have learned things millions of times, millions of new skills, and we're really good at some of them. And every time we start a new skill, we feel like, oh, I'm not good at this. I can't do it. And it, it's crazy. Every person is born with brimming confidence. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see a two-year-old learning to walk say, oh, I just, I just can't do this. <laughs> if we would start learning to walk at 20 years old, most people would be crawling into meetings. Today yeah. Because they would have given up. But the two-year-old doesn't give up. He says, I can do this and I can do it and I can do it and I can do it. And he says it a thousand folds until finally he does it. And something's happened in the process that we stop being confident. And I believe it's somewhere around kindergarten is where that starts. And they beat it out of you by the time you're 18. Mm -hmm. And so what, he, what I did with the book is I created three sections. And re really this book, even though it's written for business owners, could be a great book for parents, teachers, and business owners. Uh, I'm probably going to end up doing a second version. And I think the title will be The Confidence Architect for Parents and Teachers, where we'll take the third section of the book and change it up just a little bit. But the first section of the book is where does confidence come from? Mm -hmm. The second section of the book, what gets in the way? And the third section of, of the book is how do you bring that out of somebody else? How do you go and help somebody increase their confidence? And that third part is where the real magic in the book is. Now, truth be told, that's all for parents and teachers just as much as for business people. Just the stories they give, the examples they give, some of the stuff they give is just so much your own business that, that parents would, and teachers would have to go through it. They'll get plenty of gold. But there's a lot of stuff that they're going to push to the side because it's not necessary. Mm. So a couple of minutes ago, we threw around some words, self-esteem and confidence. And you corrected, you corrected us in that moment. We're not talking about self-esteem. We're talking about confidence. For, for our viewers and listeners, give us the difference or the connection between self-esteem and confidence and how that plays out in your book and your understanding. So actually, I have a whole chapter about the self-esteem movement and my humble opinion where it went wrong. And the self-esteem movement it was got to a point where it's, let's just make them feel good, compliment everything they do, make them feel good, you know, participation trophies. Uh, there's a quote there in a the book that I think it was 2000, I, I don't know for sure if it was 2008 or 2006, the city of Ottawa made a rule in the Little League soccer that if you won by more than five points, you were automatically disqualified. Mm. It's called a, a default because it would make the other team feel bad. And so if your team had five and you're winning and some kid who was really playing out went and knocked in another goal, it's it. Disqualified, you guys lost by default. And that's crazy, not using red pens. You, you, they took rid of the whole feedback. And the way I like to say it is the self-esteem movement had a philosophy. That philosophy was if you make your kids feel good, they'll go on to do great things. Mm. And I say it's just the opposite. Get your kids to do great things and they'll feel good. Yeah. Now, the difference between confidence in, and self-esteem, self-esteem is about how you feel about yourself. Okay. And when you're doing some, making things happen, you feel pretty good about yourself. And you know what? You don't have to feel about, good about yourself though to do great things. Confidence is about knowing that you can learn it. More than even being the knowing I can do it, knowing that I can walk into a situation, I can learn a new skill, I can become really good at it. That's what confidence is. And confidence breeds confidence. So I said a few minutes ago, success precedes confidence, not the other way around. So how do you end up getting confidence that I can learn new skills? And the answer is you've done it so many hundreds of times in your lifetime. That it's a no brainer to you to know, for you to know that you can do it. Just as a little personal sort of, um, follow along with that, Steve, I remember the first time I tried a sales job, I failed at it pitifully. I mean, just totally bombed out. And I said, I'm never doing that again. But an interesting thing happened. I was, I was, I was in my very early twenties and then I decided to join the military. And I ended up going to the Middle East twice and, you know, acquiring combat experience and having, uh, non-commissioned officers screaming in my face and, you know, 
all the things that usually go along with military service. Well, when I got out, uh, it was the bottom of the recession. And so I ended up taking a series of sales jobs that led to being in, in insurance sales. And I remember at the time, um, my, my bride asked me, she said, well, didn't you fail at sales when you were younger? I said, yeah. And she said, so aren't you a little bit nervous about trying it again? I said, I just came back from getting blown up and shot at. I don't care about a bunch of people saying no. <laughs> and I, I sort of, I sort of see the correlation there because I had gone and done something that was just as, as it was far more lethal than being told no. Um, I, I know all being told no by people. I mean, it's still discouraging if that's all you ever hear. I understand it's discouraging, but it's not, it's not a killer to me the way it was when I was, before I was young, when I was young and untested. So the, the, the act of going out and doing something significant out, out there imbues you with a sense of confidence. Well, now I can look at all these other things I could go do with my life. And, and the truth is you have to be lousy before you can be good, good before you can be great, and great before you can be awesome. And anybody thinks that they can shortcut it, I want to start out at awesome, which is what the self-esteem movement tries to do, shortcuts everything. I actually had a very interesting discussion with somebody when I was writing the book. And we were speaking about it, and she said, you know, it's really interesting. I, my 19-year-old daughter came home from college the other day, and she said she'll try everything once. But if it doesn't go, she's not going to ever try it again. Mm -hmm. And I felt so bad for this girl because she's never going to go anywhere. Because yeah. there's nothing you ever do that you're great on it the first time you do. No. And so I think the confidence is, so, so confidence is I know I can do it. And more importantly, I know I can learn it. And therefore, I have to just take the steps. Yeah. So, so what you're introducing is this mismatch, it sounds like, between the popularity of the self-esteem movement, which is all about, which we, we, like you talked about, is about feeling which doesn't have to be based on facts or any particular evidence um, because we make up feelings all the time that are not based on any form of reality. Um, and then confidence, which is based on evidence, which is developed by doing something, things that can be seen and tested. And I'm curious, as you were putting this book together, as you talk about it, you know, it's 25 years in formation, as you're putting this book together now, why is now the important time to bring confidence into the forefront? That's really just a question. So it's really more, more about my business, why it became now. Okay. I've been a business coach since 2005. There's been a style shift the last couple of years more to leadership. So, you know, in the early days, I was working with people on how do we get the business started? How do you get a market dominating position? How do you create a compelling offer? How do you buy, sell, upsell? How do you bundle? How do you change pricing? And my clients started moving and they got all that down and now they were hiring people. And the big problem for people that start hiring is they're in a new business and they don't even notice it yet. Because the business of leadership is a different business than selling with widgets. Yeah. And so now they're stepping into a whole new thing that they, that they haven't understood before. And so, so a lot of times you hear business owners saying, you know, I got good people, but I just can't get them to get it done. Or I feel like I'm hurting cats or something like that. And so I have a program that I've been using that takes care of the mechanics. There's really two different parts of, of being in, in, in leadership. The first one is this mechanical things. How do you, how do you get your vision out there? How do you get the buy-in on your mission? How do you create a three-year vision, a three-year outcome that everyone's going to work towards. How do you create the KPI so everybody knows that they're going to be able to make this done? It's going to be a no-brainer. Then how do we create the accountability system and the rhythm to make sure that all works? That's all real hard, stakey. See, there are hard skills that a lot of people can bring in. The problem is, though, when you go and you start plugging your employees into there, if you're not doing something on those soft skills hmm. and helping them see what they have to do and really to, to really understand why it's so important well, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. The, the importance of having people buy in and become confident and do their job well is a complete change in the business. And the reason it's so important to help them is, is I believe confidence comes from three things coming together. I use in a book, a Venn, a Venn diagram. So in the top of the three circles, it's accepting on yourself a new challenge, taking something you haven't done before. Now, one of the things that always happens when you take on something new is it's fearful. It's scary. 
The one on the right is you have to take deliberate action to make it happen. And the bottom left is you get results. When those three things happen, you take on a challenge, you do the hard work, and you get results, confidence gets increased. Yeah. And really, people look at the model and say, you know, wow, that really makes sense. There's nothing brilliant that, wow, where did that come from? That's so, something, you know what I mean? That's, that's divine inspiration. No, it's not. It's just an easy way to explain it that somebody can say, wow, that's pretty powerful. Now, the second, sorry, your question? No, go ahead. Uh, so the second stage is, okay, what does an employer, now that employer knows, now that a parent knows, now that a teacher knows that these are the three steps that make it happen, what's your job to help make that happen for whoever you're working with? Yeah. And I believe there's three things for that also. You need to inspire the challenge. And I use the word inspire versus motivate. In business today, we speak a lot about motivation. And I believe motivation is completely the wrong field to get people to do anything. And here's the distinction. Motivation is I, I get you to do something that I want you to do for my reasons. Yeah. Inspiration is I get you to do something you want to do for your reasons. So you're speaking to a salesman and we want to get his numbers up. I can either come to look, you know, we re- we're, we're investing a lot in you. I need for my job as manager to you to get your numbers up. The company needs your numbers up. Well, that's not all that inspiring. It might be more. No. But if I say, listen, you know what? Wouldn't it be nice to take your family on a vacation this summer because you made so much money, you never made that much money before, and you got that extra money so you can go to Disneyland with all the kids in the life? They're so good. Can I help you do that? And now all of a sudden, well, yeah, I would like to do that. And so the inspiration is up, so it'll take on the challenge. The second step where it comes to doing the taking the effort, the deliberate work the deliberate so what happens is he's going to start doing it and fear and overwhelm is going to start to come in because it always does you've never done it before you're doing it for the first time it's hard so what does he need so again there's a distinction that i think is very important in the world the world thinks that fear and courage are opposites and it's completely untrue <laughs> they're not opposites you only need courage when you're fearful if you're not fearful there's no purpose of courage. Courage is to help you push through the thing that you fear. That's all purpose of courage. So when this person's sitting there going there and he's it's starting to get hard and he feels like he's walking through spaghetti, the manager, the parent, teacher, what do they do? They have to encourage. Now, the word encourage, if you look it up in the, in the dictionary, will say you give somebody else courage. Mm-hmm. So I, the manager, I'm not going through the hard work. It's very easy for me to encourage this guy and give them courage and help him to do it. It's like if you've ever lifted weights before and you come to new weight and you're, you're pumping the iron and you get to the ninth or tenth and it's really going rough. The guy spotting you says, come on, you can do it. You got it. Just a little bit more. Just push, 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 push. It's all you. It's all you. It's all you. And you go for the tenth one and you get that out. And if that guy wasn't there encouraging you, you would have never gotten that tenth one out. Yeah. So it's a doubt if you would have gotten the ninth one. Right? So. That's the same thing that they have to do from that position. And finally, the last one, you get the, you finally get the prize, you get the results. The job is to celebrate it. Hmm. And this is probably the biggest mistake people make. And it's going to sound a little self-esteemy, but it's not because you're, you're celebrating an accomplishment and you tell them how great their work was, not how great the person is. Telling the kids they're smart or they're beautiful is a really bad idea because what happens is when you tell them they're smart and they're beautiful. What ends up happening is they want to keep that status and they're going to do whatever they can mm. to make sure nobody thinks differently. And therefore, they're not going to put the same, uh, same effort. This is from a book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And the truth is, if you praise their efforts and their work and their diligence and their integrity, so they're going to keep trying to do things to make more of that. And they're not going to be at risk. So you tell one kid, wow, you did great. You're really smart. Kid's going to say, okay, I, I'm going to make sure not to take anything too big because uh, maybe I'll be proven not smart. You tell another kid, listen, you did really good and it must be because you really worked hard and you really applied yourself. Guess what that kid's going to do? He's going to take on anything he can to prove that he keeps applying himself. Yeah. yeah. The celebration is really important. And, and I think it's really important to understand there's a difference between celebration and a compliment. And, you know, the example I like to use. Johnny comes home with a 99 on his math test. He's never had a 99 before in his life. And Dan says, hey, good job, Johnny. That's almost a compliment. Dad says, hey, Johnny, you know, I know math is difficult for you. 
And I know you, the last couple of weeks, I see you working really hard on your math and it paid off. I'm really proud to be your father. I'm really proud of you. Yeah. It's so wonderful what you did. Let's go get some ice cream together to celebrate. Mm. Now, what are the chances Johnny's going to want to go and start with a new challenge? It's huge, but it's only huge because of a celebration. If it's like, well, okay, yeah, so he did it, but that's what he's supposed to do. That's what he's hired for. You're not going to get that push. Now, imagine you have a company and every one of your employees has this cycle of a challenge, deliberate action, and celebration, and every quarter they take out a new challenge. Mm -hmm. What happens inside the company? What happens to your employees? And then what happens to outsiders that start hearing about your company and want to join? And that's, if I had to put the book in, 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 in 10 minutes, you got it. No. Yeah. Well, you did it. That's All pretty. Right. So I said, you did it. That's, uh, that's a pretty concise explanation. And it dovetailed very easy, very cleanly with what my question was earlier, which is what's the role of the employer in delivering on this promise of, uh, encouraging confidence in their employees. Yeah, and that's, that's really where it is. If you can get your, your employees to constantly up their game. And it's totally, it's not even difficult. And you, you'll meet people that had great mentors and watch the way they speak about them. They get a light in their eye, glowing, they smile, they're happy, they feel. And even they did really hard things. And other people got the boss that's, you know, screaming at them, telling them how they're, 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 they're drunk and they're watching them call. No one's putting out for that guy. The guy who gets it has people wanting to do for him to no end. Yeah. And that's, that's really what it's all about. And that's really, a, I, I believe there's a very big difference between pleasing and serving. Those are, another distinction I have that I write about in the book. Pleasing, you want to be loved. And serving is I want to do the best thing I can for my people. Yeah. So when you're pleasing, I'm going to be very careful what I say to make sure that everyone still loves me. I'm serving. I, you know what I mean? I'm not taking the baloney. I'm going to talk right where it is. I found something very interesting in my coaching practice. I used to be speaking to somebody on the, on the Zoom and I would see something that needed to be, you know, I, I can really help them with. And in the old days, they say, okay, well, let's wait and see if we become a client. I don't want to rock the boat. And I got to the point, I said, you know, that's, that's their own attitude. If it's going to rock the boat, they're not going to be a good client for me. Yes. So instead, I found a very diplomatic way to say it. And I say, you know, I have something really uncomfortable for me to share. It's going to be uncomfortable for you to hear. It's now a good time. When they say yes, the guard comes down and I can ask the question. Yeah. And you'd be amazed how many times that is the thing that made them become client. Mm. Because they see that I'm really there to serve them. I care about them. I could lose everything by doing that. And that's one guy said in one of my LinkedIn recommendations, he threw ice water on me the first time he got me. You know, where everybody else was trying to, you know, coddle me. So great coaches usually do. They do. Yeah. That's right. hundred percent. But th now let, thinking about everything that, that we've talked mm -hmm. about so far here, Steve, now you're looking at back at the process of becoming an author. This is your first book, right? You haven't written one before. I've written some booklets. Booklets. Okay. But, but like, there are 50, 60 pages. Okay. But going through this process, you know. How did you see, you know, it's, it's, it seems to me like one of these processes because of the content of what you're writing about, you're almost writing it and then asking yourself throughout the process, am I drinking my own Kool-Aid here? Right. Am I, am I following what I'm teaching people to do in the book? So what, how, how did you find yourself maybe butting up against it or being reinforced and moved forward through it, uh, maybe even an advantage as you. Uh, wrote and finished the book. Well, I will tell you this. There is nothing you will ever do to help you get clarity on what you're thinking about, like writing a book. You know, when you write a book, the clarity you have on the topics that you wrote about mm -hmm. is, is, is unbelievable. Actually, what happened, it's very interesting. I sent out my first seven chapters to a group of people to give me feedback. And one guy said, your fifth chapter is really the main one that should be pushed way up front and ended up being the second chapter and the book was much better because of it. Mm -hmm. and yeah. I had gone through a second model they have in the book about the comfort zone and I had that first kind of like laying out the work to get to my model. 
He said, no, get your model first and then I'll explain how the comfort zone fits in. And he was a hundred percent right. Mm. So the, the look. Like okay, anybody else, I'm a human being. There's things that I want to do and now, you know, I'm kind of nervous about them. I'm not sure it's going to work. And, 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 and you have your, those pulls in yourself that are pulling you back and you got to push through it. You got to get that courage. And I would say it's, I don't know if I've come across anything big over the last year that it's made me really look at that. But when you have the philosophical bin, that's where it's at. And you really understand you got to be lousy before good, good before great, great before awesome. You know what I mean? Uh, that's, that becomes a different game. Yeah. So in your work, uh, as a business coach and also in writing this book, which is, as you mentioned, I'm glad you brought it up. is such a clarifying, um, process, you know, it's distilling down all the things that are really valuable, really meaningful. You really want to say these items and then throwing away the things that you're like, yeah, it's not, maybe they're on the fringes. I don't want to bring that up just yet. So you've gone through this process of, of coaching, of writing a book to impart this topic of confidence or impart to the reader this topic of confidence, why it's important in their business. What happens, what happens to a person when whoever they're working with, the confidence doesn't seem to take hold, doesn't seem to take root. What do you do then? That's an awesome question. Not everybody is a good employee for your company. I have four criteria I think make up good employees. Okay. Number one, they have the aptitude to do the work. Number two, they have a good attitude to both the work and it's going to be an enhancement to the company, not a drain. Number three is they have a good work ethic. And number four is a coachable. And if those four are not in place, that's not a good hire. And when you start putting this in place, sometimes it shows you who's good. And I think at that point, the owner says, you know what? I think this isn't working out. Let me see if I can make some connections with you to find a place that would be a good place for you. You Which, still be that serving person. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, so uh, as, uh, continue, continue that thought. And then I, I want to bring in something. Else. Yeah. I think that the owner should still be serving unless the guy is, he, you know, he can't really find any beneficial part to him. Yeah. And he should try to, you know, try to help them. You know, that's, that's part of what we do as people. But in other words, it's not, it's not, sorry, you're not a good fit. Get out of here. I mean, ultimately it is, but try to ease them out. You want them when they leave that they're speaking well of you and speaking well of your company, not that jerk. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't let anybody work for him. Well, yeah. I think that gets back to the topic of service that you brought up. Yes, it is. It absolutely. It is serving your employees well is helping them find the best fit. And a lot of times we as individuals don't know our best fit looking from the inside out, it really takes somebody else with perhaps a bit more insight to look at us and identify the characteristics that we don't readily see, especially it seems if we're kind of the, the beginning part of developing confidence, looking for evidence, sometimes that evidence is best seen by somebody else. And you know, sometimes it's just in the wrong seat of the company. Also, you might not need to have to leave the company, but you're in sales. You don't belong in sales. You belong in customer service. You've got guys, great personality to help people with their problems but you're not the guy that's going to go out hunting. Yeah. And sometimes it's not. I had somebody call me recently that he's, he, had a, he had an executive assistant and just wasn't getting done the way he needed. And I told him my four points and she's great attitude, decent work ethic, but I don't think it's really the right fit for him. I said, good, then you got to help her go find it, find something else that's gonna, that'll work for her and then go find somebody else with a position. Yeah. It's simple. Yeah, I had that a couple of years ago. I had two writers. One was really good at short copy. The other one was really good at blogs, but I had the copywriter doing blogs and the blogger doing copywriting and once, and the, and it was a headache. I was constantly fixing errors. Then I flip-flopped them and I stopped. Everything just went. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look at Here's the thing. There's another truth. Every employee wants to do well. There are some people that are come to jobs because they want money and they don't really care about anything else. You know, Brian Tracy used to always make a joke that a guy who came in looking for a job and the uh, owner said, sorry, we don't really need help. He said, it's okay. It won't be much, you know? <laughs> and so there are people like that, but that's not most people. Most people like to excel and would like to be given a chance to excel and they'd like to make more money. They'd like to do things important. They'd like to have a mission. They'd like to, have, they would love to have that, but they need an owner or they need a business owner, a manager that says, Hey, I can help you with that. 
Mm-hmm. And if you work with me, we can do it together. And everybody in the world, you know, in a certain sense, I'm going to say this is a little bit pejorative, but it's true. Most people are walking around holding their umbilical cord, looking for somebody else to plug it into after them. Mm. And, and, no. and, and I think that there is there, although in a certain sense, it's, it's a little bit wry and a little bit rough on people, but the truth is if you're a business owner that understands that, so you, ha- you can have an impact on your employees, you can change their lives, you can change their worlds. And there's so many people that you, successful people will tell you, listen, point where my success really started was I had this one mentor and this guy, he didn't let me do it. He didn't, you know, he let me, he, may, he forced me to do the things I had to do. And I was able to find that in the service a lot. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And, and in the book, I, 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 I speak about some great coaches and one of them was Lou Holtz. Now Lou Holtz coached football for 34 years. And my contention, if you went to 34 years of guys that who played for Lou Holtz and said, describe Coach Holtz, not one would say, oh, he was a nice guy. Yeah. That's not what they, that's not what he was there for. That's not what they were doing together. But if at the same time, right afterwards, you would ask them, did you ever see a softer time, softer side of coach? 100% of them will be able to tell you a story when something happened at home and you were you're going through a difficulty, a parent died, a sister died, you know, some, some calamity happened and man, coach, coach host was there for me. Mm-hmm. He was yeah. there to help me pull me through it. And that's why you see that kind of loyalty and the business community could have that same kind of loyalty from their employees. If they brought to the employees, what coach host brought to his players. Yeah. That's basically what the book is really all about. Well, and I like how you bring out that this is more than just a business book. The principles are really principles of human nature, it sounds like, and how we learn to develop confidence within ourselves and what the, what a difference that makes. And then how we can look at others and treat them in a way that helps them build confidence when they perhaps are unaware of that. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Because people don't bring, uh, one of my favorite quotes is people don't bring personal problems into their business and people don't have business problems. They have personal problems they bring into their business. hundred yeah. percent true. Yeah. And that's on all levels. And you know what, when you, when people start to figure it out and they don't get, you know, so what's the word I want? So bothered by the situations. I have a couple of things. I have one chapter there. It's when, when, when speaking about what is self-confidence and what gets in the way, one of the things is how we tell our stories. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can recreate a lot of people under the misconception that your present is based on your past. And it's really the opposite. Your past is based on your present. The way you look at your past will define how you relate to that past. So if I look at something, instead of saying that happened to me, instead of of saying that happened for me, or I start looking at things that happen differently, all of a sudden they're not a drain on me and they're not, I'm not fighting with it. Whereas if I don't do that, I'm in a constant fight. And so how do we tell our story different? How do we, you know, that teacher in the back of the mind that's, you know, wah, 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 Charlie Brownish, you know, what, what do we do to get rid of that or change that voice that it's no longer hurting us? And I have this really cool exercise in the book where you take the person, you get an image of the person screaming at you, and then you increase the octave three times. <laughs> and then you increase the three three times. So now this person was really harsh and was screaming, you were going crazy. And you see the clients start to laugh and say, okay, I want you to put the face inside of a daisy, a big sunflower. <laughs> and now it's funny. Now put it on the backside of an elephant and have the elephant running through a, a, an alley in New York City. Well, guess what? That voice is gone now. That voice can never harm you again because you've repositioned it to a place that is so comical and so funny. Every time you think about them screaming, you're going to be thinking about them inside the the sunflower on the backside of an elephant three times faster, three times higher, and you're going to laugh. Yeah. And if you laugh at that voice, guess what? It has zero power on you anymore. Yeah. And we can do that. We all can do that. We can all go and change our past in ways that it's not impeding our present or future, but we want to hold on to our stories. And then you can let go of your stories. Wow. Amazing things happen. You have to realize most people are, are, are just working in a small fraction of where their abilities are. 
Yeah. And it's, it's not small, it's not big steps. It's small steps to make that step working differently. And everybody can do that. Absolutely. It's I a like, topic. That, sorry, go ahead, Paul. I, I like, uh, Steve, that, that you're challenging people, um, to not settle for what they're born with, but to pursue what they can grow into. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I love the, the whole inner critic treatment there that you do. Mine is simply to say, well, you've told me what I've done wrong. Now go show me how to do it right. <laughs> and he okay. never does. Uh, yeah. He never, he never, <laughs> steps, <laughs> never steps forward and says, let me show you how it's done. I'll fix it for you. We'll do this together. Never does. Disappear yep. from, from him again. Yeah. But I, I love that. Uh, I love the direction of this because what it's doing it like it, it, is, is, is this taking people and you're not leaving them, uh, you're, you're treating them as, you know, give a man, uh, treat a man as he could be, and he'll become what he should be, you know, treat a man as he is, and he'll remain as he is. You're not, you're not advocating that at all. You're in fact saying that's the, completely the wrong way to go. And I think when, when authors come into writing with that same mindset, what will I become as a result of doing this? Who will I become even better? You know, what, what will I be able to turn around and look back and say, oh, I did that. And I, you know, I think it's true in little kids. It's true with employees. It's true anywhere. We, the, the, the more we take action and achieve results, just the, the, the less, the, 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 the more the lack of confidence just gets to almost negligible, if at all. Absolutely. Yeah. And as long as you're always pursuing things bigger than where you are, there's always going to be that little bit of a, a tug. Maybe I can't do it this time. And you're going to do it. Well, I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of a topic that you brought up, which is this idea of stories and the meaning that we, uh, the Attention. meaning that we uh, create as, as we listen to these stories from our past, we recite these things to ourselves. And then yep. I love what you talk about that we create the meaning from the past and the present and how, how just addressing that, which, you know, is a big issue, I think for all of us, just addressing that can totally change today and the future outlook. It's more than we have time for today, but it would seem that confidence based on evidence is all part of developing uh, a new meaning for all of the stories from our past. Absolutely. I just saw a quote from Alex Hamosi, another one that was a bomb quote. He said, if you think about the things you're proud of in life, you'll never think about the things that you did, but about the difficult situations you had to go through in order to get there. Yeah. The fights that you had or the, the difficulty or your, your self fight, or even it was hard. You did it anyways. The story that really gets you going is not the fact, wow, I did it. Yeah. It's I had to push through those things and I did it. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of value in that. We've got a lot of truth bombs that are being dropped here on the MSR. I have to do a part yeah. with this, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Well, Steve, it's been great having you on the emissary authors podcast and uh, we've, we've shared a QR code and some links in the chat if you've been watching on the video, but for people listening on the audio version, uh, what would be the best place for people to come and, and look for you if they want to find out more? So if they, um, go to my LinkedIn and it's, you put Steve Lover in there, I think I'm the only one there, uh, but it's, it's a LinkedIn forward slash I N forward slash your dash business dash coach. So anybody's welcome LinkedIn. I, I have, um pretty decent following and I do answer anybody who writes to me there and second off, get hold of the book. It's on Amazon. If you put Steve lover in the, uh, in the search, my book comes up first because I don't think there's any other author the name by name uh, in the world by the name of Steve lover. And you'll know it's the right page because it's got the book's called ignite and it's got a, a pretty fiery cover. All right. And I welcome back any uh, feedback anybody has. Well, Great to be with you again, Steve. So nice to have you on the show. The book is called Ignite, Fueling World-Class Performance. Even if your employees are not yet world-class, the author is our friend, Steve Lover. My name is Paul Edwards. My co-host is Jason Todd. And 
This is the Emissary Authors Podcast signing off. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.